This episode was recorded at Spotify Studios LA. Hey, y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, doula and author of On Thriving, Harnessing Joy Through Life's Great Labors, Brandy Sellers-Jackson talks to me about the power of sharing our stories in community. As a young girl growing up in Alabama, Brandy functioned in survival mode. But when she found the courage to revisit her grief and trauma later in life, Brandy discovered that there is healing in community. The trials of our lives can leave us feeling isolated in our pain, but the truth is we are never alone. When we share our story, when we share, you know, our grief, when we share our journey, there's someone else is like, oh yeah, same, same over here. And it just expands us in such a way and expands our community, expands those around us. And yeah, we see how connected we are. Brandy, welcome to the pod. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm great. I am so <laughs> excited you're here. Thank I you. think that you are just extraordinary. I think you're beautiful. I think you're talented. Thank you. I think you're wise. And mm-hmm. I am so excited to get to know you better. Likewise. Thank you. <laughs> and I think the same of you. Thank you, so. sis. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you want to start by telling everyone how we met? Let's see. Sure. Okay. Was it a play? It was a play. Mm -hmm. And we ran into each other really briefly. Yeah. Like super brief. Slave play. There we go. It was slave play. I saw you outside. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I ran into you and it was such a quick exchange. Mm -hmm. It was like, hi, how are you? And then we're like, okay, bye. Yes. (laughs) And it was so quick. Yeah. But it was so like, okay, joy. Yeah. (laughs) So that's my first recollection of you Mm -hmm. is just a burst of joy oh thank you just like just like and joy oh and then it was like okay bye (laughs) (laughs) and then we've we've you know been able to see each other much more we have like mutual friends realizing exactly um yeah but yeah i do remember that yeah Yeah. it was was, uh waiting to get into slave play (laughs) exactly yeah yeah Yeah. it was a good play yeah all right brandy let's start at the beginning so Mm. You were born in Bristol, Connecticut. Yes. And you moved to Alabama when you were young. Yes. So what would you say Connecticut and Alabama and Alabama have given you? So Connecticut, it was I remember snowsuits. Mm-hmm. Me too. I have such fond memories. It was so much fun. I remember one time I got zipped in it. Yeah, yeah. You I can't, was like, ah, you can't so get I'm, out. I'm still stressed about like zippers getting too. <laughs> Close yeah. to my neck. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, it's the whole, yeah. you know, snowsuit, and then you got to put on the coat <laughs> on top of it. Yeah. Um, I remember snowsuits, and I remember the cold, and I remember um, walking in the snow and the sound of the snow beneath my feet, like mm. the crunching of mm-hmm. it. I remember that. Um, for Alabama, I think I have the majority of my memories because mm-hmm. I was seven when I moved yeah. to Alabama. And when I think of Alabama, I think of fireflies or lightning bugs, what we used to call them, lightning bugs. And I remember summers and how me and my cousins would run around and play all day, Mm. get sweaty and like, you know. Smell like outside. That. I was just about (laughs) to say that. Smell like you you outside. Yeah. Yeah. and I remember us playing till literally nighttime outside, just playing and playing and playing and playing. Um, I remember my aunts and my grandmothers just all cooking mm-hmm. and my mother in the kitchen. And yeah, I think when I think of Alabama, I think of family and I think of warmth. I think of community. Um, I think of home. Mm-hmm. Although I haven't called it home in decades, but I still think of home there. Um, I went there this past summer to visit my grandmother, and 
it was just, we surprised her with a photo shoot. Mm. And I don't know if you saw my grandmother, but she is absolute magic. Mm. And she's stunning. And she's just beautiful. She's everything. And um, we, me and her granddaughters and her daughter, who's the same age as I am, it's a long story. <laughs> um, <laughs> we all surprised her with a photo shoot. And we all showed up there in this field outside. And it was just beautiful. So when I think of Alabama, I think of her. Mm. I think of beauty. I think of warmth and and just just all the good things. Yeah, yeah. I I feel like when people um, see you or think mm-hmm. of you, um, one of the first things that comes to mind is your family and mm-hmm. how beautiful you all are and how genuine and. Uh, the word that's coming to mind is free. Mm, that yeah. that you all are. Yeah, and the the type of home that you've created for for yourself and mm-hmm. and your partner and your kids. Yeah, and so I want to know what what did you talk to us about Alabama? But what did your childhood home mm. feel and look like? Ooh, so my childhood home. Yeah, looked completely different. Mm. than my current home. Um, My current home, like you said, it's very free. Um, My three beautiful black boys are all over the place. They are curious. They are fearless, like to the point where I sometimes worry. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, so we're just going to jump off of that. (laughs) Oh, okay. That's what we're doing. Got it. Cool, cool, cool. Um. They're fearless, they're brave, and they're living a childhood free of trauma, Mm. which is very different than the childhood that I had. Yeah. Um, That that was my childhood, was just Mm. safety, protection, being aware, being 10 times smarter and wiser than what I should have had to be. So for me, it, it really, I had to get into some deep, 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 deep work Yeah, to where I had to unlearn and un- and process and give myself space <sighs> yeah. to process too. Mm-hmm. Because for so long I hadn't done that. I had kind of downplayed everything that I had seen. And it wasn't until mm. I had a conversation with my grandmother um, when I was writing the book because I wanted to interview her Mm -hmm. and I wanted to kind of, um, I was writing the chapter on um, rest and how rest is a form of resistance. And I was interested to know how rest had kind of like uh, evolved over the years and what rest looked like for my grandmother, what it looked Mm -hmm. like for her mother and what it looked like for her grand her great grandmother what did it look like what did rest look like yeah and it was such a beautiful moment because she told me all these stories about my great grandmother my great great grandmother mm-hmm. and all this it was beautiful and how they would sit outside and play baseball and this was you know this was how they rested right yeah. and their communion and church and all that was rest for them and it wasn't until um we were talking and I said you know grandma I just want to say thank you I said, because your house, your home, was the place that I could. And before I could say it, she said, rest. Mm. And that did two things for me. Mm. It, one, it validated what I knew to be true about my childhood. (sighs) Yeah. Because it's like when you're an adult and you... Try to piece things together, yeah. right? And it's kind of hard because it's like, was it scary because it was actually scary? Or was it scary because I was so small and everyone's so big, mm. right? And so for her to say, it's where you could rest. She knew. She knew. She you knew. It, and she knew you needed it. Right. And she wanted to provide it for you. She did. Yeah. And it did so much for me because it it showed me. And it revealed to me, no, what you you went through. Very real experience. Very real experience. It was really scary. Mm. And it shouldn't have happened. Yeah. So um, 
I think that between that and so many other conversations, that was the that was the catalyst for me. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Talk to me about not so private parts. What led you there? So after my first miscarriage, mm. um, I found that it, there weren't many spaces to talk about it. And I feel like, I don't know, I, I always say, you know, grief was the starter, you know, for me um, in this whole thing. I didn't know who to talk to. I had friends who had experienced pregnancy loss, but it's kind of weird going up to people and saying, hey, you know that time you had that miscarriage? You want to talk about it? Yeah. Like, it's kind of, can't really, you know, you got to test the waters with that, mm-hmm. you know, because everyone's not, they don't, some people don't want to talk about it and it's okay, mm-hmm. right? And then also I was Googling, because that's where a lot of people go when they <laughs> need answers. I was Googling. This was in 2015, 2015, 2014 maybe. You know, I'm Googling and I'm like, okay, what to do after a miscarriage, you know? And, you know, just basic questions. How do I take care of myself after a miscarriage? Mm. Um, uh, d- how long until I can have sex mm-hmm. after miscarriage? Is it six weeks, like after you give birth? What's that, you know? Um, all these questions. And questions that a, yeah. a doctor didn't offer. No. Mm. They just sent me on my way. Yeah. They're like, okay, well, you know. Well, and what really happened, I mean, the first miscarriage, it was it was long and grueling and it wasn't quick. You know, a lot of people think that with miscarriage, it's this, you know, yeah. very quick, you know, bloody mess and you, there, that's it. And it's not. For some, at least for me, it was weeks. Weeks. Wow, Brandy. Weeks. What? Yeah, I've never, I didn't even yeah. know yeah. that. Weeks. Wow. And I remember going to, when it started, it was the 4th of July. So mm. that was fun. Uh, I went to the hospital because everything was closed. And I, I'll, I'll never forget, you know, they did the ultrasound and there was a strong heartbeat. How and far like, along were you? It was first trimester, mm-hmm. you know. And they're like, oh, it's a strong heartbeat. And I was like, okay, so is everything okay? Because I'm bleeding, and, you know. And the doctor said, well, your body's trying to decide, basically. It's trying to, de- you know, just to decide if it wants to keep this pregnancy or not. Mm. So we're just going to have to wait and see. And I remember those words hitting me like, wait, I, di- I, di- I didn't know it could do that. Like, wait, run that back. You mean my body is deciding if it wants to keep a pregnancy, who, wait, who who gave it that permission? Mm-hmm. I don't understand. Like, I I run this show. Like, I don't, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I run this. Um, and I quickly learned that I don't. Um, birth and miscarriage way above my pay grade. Don't mm-hmm. control that. And weeks, weeks of bleeding, w- weeks of bed rest. And eventually I miscarried. And I remember Googling just all these questions, you know, I didn't know that, for one, if you have a miscarriage, you still are postpartum. So you're still coming down from the hormonal part of pregnancy. That doesn't stop. Didn't know that. So I, you know, continued back to doing all the things that I love to do and was just feeling all the feels, Mm -hmm. not knowing why. Um, and I just Googled. I kept Googling, and I didn't find answers. I was looking for community. And one day, I was just like, well, I guess I have to be the change that I wanted. Mm-hmm. I need to be the community that I needed. And so I just decided I called a dear friend of mine, Alex L, actually. Oh, and, I love Alex. Yes. Oh, she's the best. And I asked her, I said, you know, I th- I'm thinking about one day writing a book where, you know, I tell my story and people tell their stories about whether it's miscarriage or loss or, you know, pooping on the uh, uh, delivery table or whatever. Just these these stories where people feel a little less alone. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, why don't you just start a blog? And I was like, oh, well, that's simple. That's easy (laughs) enough, (laughs) you know. That sounds like Alex. I was like, that's easy enough. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, January 1st, 2016, mm-hmm. I pressed 
the publish button to my first blog, just detailing my miscarriage. And that just kind of started everything. And it was one of those things that really changed the trajectory of my life. Mm. Like, just like that. How so? so? How did it change the trajectory? Well, it, one, it created community, Mm -hmm. the community that I needed. From there, I started doing events where, you know, I would invite, you know, people to talk and share and um, and then that I ended up becoming a doula after that. And then I continued writing. And then before I knew it, I was, you know, it was just one thing after another. It was like this, like one, one step went to another step and it then mm. another step. And then before I knew it, my life com- looked completely different yeah. than what it was. Yeah. And so, um, and you had more community and I had more community. Yeah. So it's like a win-win, you know? Um, Sounds like your your world expanded. It did. After that. It did. And it's funny because it's, I feel like that is the case for so many of us. It's like when we share our story, when we share, you know, our grief, when we share our journey, there's someone else is like, oh yeah, same, same over here. Yeah. We're not, right? we're never yeah. truly alone. No, we're not. And it just expands us in such a way. Yeah. And expands our community, expands mm-hmm. those around us and- yeah, we see how connected we are. Mm. So, yeah. Can you tell us what is a doula? Ooh. <laughs> so I'll start with what a doula is not. Mm, okay. Yeah. A doula is not magic. We are not magic. <laughs> and I say that because a lot of times people will uh, assume that if I have a doula, I don't need an epidural because I have a doula. <laughs> mm, and if I it. do need an epidural, then that doula is not doing her job. And it's like, I am not paying, I'm not, I'm not a unicorn. Yeah. I am not going to keep you from experiencing pain in this moment. Mm -hmm. That's just unheard of. It's not. But what I am here to do is make sure that you feel supported, that you feel held, and that you're not alone. And that, and I, one of the things I always remind people is that, you know, this pain, because pain can be so triggering. Yeah. Especially if you, um, whether, I mean, I've had clients who were, you know, victims of, you know, sexual assault. It can be triggering mm-hmm. and you can start feeling like it's happening again. Wow. Right? And so one of the things I tell my clients is this pain is different. This pain, you are safe. This pain is getting you closer to your baby. We're going to breathe through this pain. We're safe in this pain. We're okay. Mm-hmm. You know? So that's the first thing. Doulas are not magic. We are not an epidural. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> We're not. Yeah. Um, let's see. We are not medical professionals. A lot of people get doulas confused with midwives. Yes. And we're not the same. Okay. I've had people... <laughs> On the Lolo, try to ask me to be at their home birth in uh, uh, like a substitute mm. su- um, sub- substitution oh. for a midwife. And I'm like, no, ma'am, <laughs> because I'm not trained in that. Mm-hmm. I'm not trained to um, know if you are um, uh, about to hemorrhage. Mm. I'm not trained to know that, right? I don't know. If, you know, we need to transport. I don't know, right? I'm just going to go off of my gut. And you don't want that in birth. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> you look you look like you I might mean, be ready. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't maybe know. so. Maybe. Let's roll a die. <laughs> yeah. Let's just see. Like, you don't want that. Yeah. You don't yeah, want yeah. that during your birth. Midwives are for that. Mm-hmm. They are trained to know Oh, we need to transfer. Oh, we I mean, they literally come with a whole medical bag. Got of it. All the medical tools, Pitocin to like, mm. you know, for like all the things. They come with all the things. What's in the doula bag? Um, we come with <laughs> <laughs> we come with like a rebozo scarf and Yes. <laughs> yes. It's like, you know, to kind of like help, you know, relieve pressure. And we come with, like, essential oils, <laughs> you know, things like and that. And a whole lot of love. And a lot of grit. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not downplaying us, but I am saying, like, our 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 job is to, one, yes, help with pain management. 
We're not going to take away the pain, but we'll do like hip squeezes and 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 compressions, you know. We'll do that, you know, counter pressure mm -hmm. on the back of the back to help relieve a little bit of pain. That helps a lot. Yeah. It does. I've done it at times the entire birth mm -hmm. for like 11 hours straight, just like yeah. contractions. Um, but we're not, we're there for comfort. Mm -hmm. We're there that at, when after your baby, we might be in the kitchen making you a meal. Yeah. You know, making sure, okay, baby's on the boob. If you decide to breastfeed, okay, you're you're comfortable. All right, you're eating, great. That's what we're there for. Mm -hmm. We're there for, you know, prenatal. So if you're like feeling all the things, you know, with the, the in-laws, we're there yeah. to kind of like, you know, we might kind of like help you troubleshoot if you don't really want you know, your in-laws there right now, mm -hmm. right after the baby. How do you have this conversation? Yeah. We're there for that. Yeah, good. Which this is, is hey, great. that's needed. It's amazing. But we are not there to like, <laughs> let me catch it. We're, we're yeah, not there it, for that. What, what I'm gathering is that the doula is very much so in support of the mother. Right. Exactly. Um, what has um, being a doula taught you? Oh, my gosh. It's taught me how to nurture myself. Mm, while nurturing others. Yeah, because it's important. It's it's kind yeah. of a non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable. Yeah. Like, I have to uh, nurture myself if I want to nurture anyone else mm -hmm. out there. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. I had to think about that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so before we get into your fabulous book, yes. I want to know how you would describe this current season of your life mm -hmm. and what was the season just before this season? What did that season look like? Ooh, geez, Louise. <laughs> okay, so this season has felt easeful, very easeful. It's felt um, soft. It's felt light. I think the season before this, <laughs> the opposite. Mm. It felt heavy. It felt hard. Um, it, it was a lot. Mm. It was a lot. And a lot is the word I want to use, like all, all caps. Yeah. <laughs> so then what was the moment when you felt it change? Mm. What, what was happening in your life? When I started to center myself, um, I have been married for a very long time, a really long time. <laughs> uh, we were married in our early 20s. Mm -hmm. So 22. Wow. Yeah. It's young. It's very young. And now that I'm in my 40s and I look back and I'm like, I imagine myself going home like, I'm in love. And the way my parents looked at me like, <laughs> I understand now. Mm -hmm. I understand now because now I have a teenager who's 17. And if I can only imagine if next year he came home and was like, I'm in love. I'd be like, you don't know anything about love. <laughs> like, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> sit down. <laughs> you know, like, I understand now. Okay. Um, but we, we were married really, really young. And, um... Yeah, I think that right there, it a lot of my identity ran into that. Mm -hmm. You know, being someone's wife. Oh, and now I'm pregnant. Oh, someone's mother. Right? So because of that, now I'm thinking of them and, and I'm just somewhere floating in the ether. Just mm -hmm. floating somewhere, right? And so... Yeah. Yeah. I think that was the thing for me. I, I kind of like, I realized how much of my identity was tethered into that. And when I began to kind of untie myself from it, not distance, but untether it and start to really look into myself, that's when I started to kind of like, 
things started to click, if that makes sense. 1,000%. Yeah. Did you feel guilt in doing so or no? At first. Mm. Yeah, at first I did. I think it's it's natural that I would. Yeah. At first I was like, it felt blasphemous. It felt like, whoa, wait, what? Put myself first. What? Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> D- take care of myself. What? But I had to. Yeah. Because we've all seen it where we have these parents, right, who their life is their kids. Mm-hmm. And their kids grow up because kids grow up. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> and they leave and they live their life. And then you still have you. Mm-hmm. You're still with you. Got to know yourself. Got to love yourself. Got to honor right? yourself. Got to enjoy yourself. Yeah. And 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 your relationship. Yeah. You know, Daryl and I talked about that recently. We don't even have kids yet. And I was like, listen. Yeah. Once these kids get here, we have to remember it was us first yes. and it's gonna be us yeah when they leave it's still gonna yeah. be us yeah. and like again we were we just were having this conversation pre-kids because yeah. I understand yeah. how important it is that we stay solid that yes. we stay locked you in. still have you <laughs> you are stuck with you yeah these kids are gonna live their lives they sure are they we are. did uh, <laughs> Living them now. Yeah, yeah, And it's yeah, yeah. like, you know, we have to, we're stuck with us. Mm-hmm. I'm stuck with this person, me. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't get away from her. Yeah. Like, she follows me everywhere I go. Yeah. So, yeah. was it a conversation? Did you, like, have a conversation with your partner about it? No. I mean, 2020 was rough. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things that, you know, and I write about it in the book. Top of 2020, our lives completely completely, completely changed in that moment. Um, I, you know, we had been married, what? I forgot how many years at that point. Jeez Louise. And life just switched on us. Yeah, It changed, it shifted. And I didn't really know what he wanted to do. But I knew in that moment, regardless, I was stuck with me. It's all tracking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm stuck with me. <sighs> and and I'm mm. stuck with this person I still have to co-parent with. Yeah. So he started doing his work. He started going to therapy on his own mm-hmm. journey. I started going on my journey because I was like, oh, well, you going? I'm going to therapy too. <laughs> we just both going to be going, therapy. We just going to be going to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what day is your appointment? Well, mine's Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you get that figured out. Yeah. Um, but we did, you know, mm. and we went, you know, our own path yeah. of just healing. I had trauma that I had yet to acknowledge mm-hmm. as trauma. And we start, the more we started to dig, the more we found. And then eventually we ended up. Mm-hmm. getting back. Yeah. And then we started like couples therapy. But it wasn't even like a thing of like, oh, let's do couples therapy to see like if we can. No, it was more so like, let's just even see if we can co-parent together mm-hmm. because we got to do that. It was that. And it was just a lot of, lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Yeah. Like so much work. But yeah, that's really what it. Yeah. Can you talk to me about work and the personal work, marriage work mm. in the midst of parenting work? Oh my God, it's all work. It's so hard. Yeah. But here's the thing, though. I think of it this way. You know, hard is hard, right? Mm-hmm. Not doing the work is hard because you're going to have to deal with stuff. You're going to keep dealing with the lesson yeah. until you deal with it, right? And kids. I always say kids are so childish. (laughs) (laughs) Children are so childish. Their work. So, and that's hard sometimes. So it's a matter of pick your hard. Hmm. Which hard do you want? Do you want to do the hard that's going to benefit you in the long run? Or do you want to just keep avoiding? Yeah. Which is going to be hard eventually. Mm -hmm. So I chose the... Hard that might be hard now, but it's gonna it's gonna pay off 
mm-hmm. in dividends later. Yeah. You know? And um, I had to really, like, you know, I started, you know, I did the whole psychedelic therapy and all that. And I was able to see the ways that I was this hurt little girl, right? Um, still looking for safety and looking for, like, nurturing Mm -hmm. and wanting that from, you know, everyone outside versus giving it to myself. Yeah. You know? And then he did the same thing. So I think if I took anything is that we both have our stories Mm. and one isn't more significant that there's space for both of them to exist and to be seen. And that's easier said than done, you know? But it's important that when you look at the person who's across from you, that you see them, mm-hmm. that you see that they're human and that they they have their own story of how they got here, mm-hmm. you know? That they're not just your wife or your husband or your child, that they have things that they are navigating and trying to figure out as well. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, let's talk about your book. Yeah. On Thriving, Harnessing Joy Through Life's Great Labors. First of all, how did you get to the title? I, I'm obsessed with Ooh. how authors get to titles of books. You know, I wanted to think of a title that summed up the entire book. Mm-hmm. But then also to the message that I was trying to convey, like, when you read the entire thing and you get to the very end, what is the feeling that I want you to feel? Mm-hmm. And so I wanted people to feel that they could thrive in whatever space they're in, whether it's in grief, whether it's in relationship, whether it's in feeling othered, and whether it's in their mental health. I wanted them to feel like I can thrive. I can, you can put me anywhere. Yeah. And I'm going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's the story of like how the book came about? Did uh, did people always believe in the book? Did you feel like you had to like convince anybody that this book was as wonderful and poignant as it is? What's the what's the backstory? Um, I wanted to write the book that I needed. Mm-hmm. I always say, but you have to if you want to create something. I always say this: you have to start with what you want first. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I wanted to write the book that I needed and what I needed in all those spaces that I've named. You know, when I was dealing with grief, the grief of my mother, when I was navigating the relationship with myself and realizing, oh, I need to re- figure out this relationship with myself. Mm-hmm. And then my relationship with everyone else around me. When I was figuring that stuff out, what is the book? that would kind of make it easier. It's like we throw out these words like self-care and all that kind of stuff and lean in and all that, all these like catchphrases. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to simplify it a lot and put it in practical terms. Like this is, if self-care were a verb, this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. This is how you take care of yourself. Yeah. This is how you center yourself. This is how you look after your heart. This is how you do it. I didn't want to talk in um, these, like, like very vague, you know, you just go and you take a bath and, then oh, like, yeah. you know, you drink some no, tea no, no. and, you, you know, you do the thing, right? I wanted people to, to um, feel that. I wanted people also to feel this, like, kinship um, and this community because community has always been a big thing for me. So mm-hmm. this community of not feeling alone. You know? And so I I wanted that too. I wanted people to feel this sense of belonging and the sense of community and that they're not alone. Yeah. That's what I really wanted is that they're not alone. You're not alone. Mm-hmm. You're not the only one that's de- that's dealing with whatever you're dealing with. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of folks. Mm-hmm. And this is how we navigate this. And we're going to navigate it together. Mm. And the thing that makes my heart so happy is that, again, people, when they read it, I hope that they feel that sense of community that I've read with so many other books, but that they feel 
heard, they feel seen, Mm -hmm. and they don't feel alone. They don't feel alone. Yeah. I'll tell you, one of the things that jumped out for me is uh, what you call rich feels. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to explain what that is? Because I thought it was just so profound and something that I want to incorporate. Yeah. Um, in my everyday life and, yeah. and yeah. pass down to my future children and mm-hmm. you know so so tell us what, yeah. what that is. Yeah, it's it's a it's more so like, you know, the things that enrich us. Yeah. So those making those things that make us better, make us feel warm, make us feel um special. Mm-hmm. Those becoming our rituals. And it doesn't have to be necessarily something so like, oh I'm gonna soak in a tub, although I do a love a good soak. As do I. I love a good a good soak, but more so. Um, even if it's just, I'm just gonna sit, and I'm gonna tap. Mm-hmm. That's something I've been getting into, and I love it. Or I'm going to wake up in the morning, and I'm going to make myself some molasses tea every morning. Or, you know, I'm gonna go for a walk. Mm-hmm. Doing those things that support us and enrich us that's a ritual yeah even you know i even talk about in the section on rest um sleep training you know we always think of sleep training for kids Mm -hmm. but sleep training for adults (laughs) yeah right i was like wow i didn't remember i I didn't think about this for adults wow sleep training for adults yeah right so real yeah so like you know what's your sleep ritual is it that you lay in your bed and you're on the phone the entire time until you fall asleep and it hits you in the face, the mm-hmm. phone, because you're holding it and it hits you in the face? And yeah. Um, or is it, what does it look like? And really being intentional. That's really what it comes down to is this intentional way of moving. Yeah. Throughout your day versus your day just kind of going. Yeah. You know, so at night it looks like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, wash my face or I'm going to. You know, that I'm going to lay down, I'm going to put my phone outside of my door. I'm going to watch whatever I want to watch if I watch anything mm-hmm. until this time. And after that, I'm going to turn it off. And then I'm going to turn on some sound or not. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm going to do. It's about being intentional, really. Yeah. And so, and I think it's great for those of us who aren't really used to doing that who perhaps are used to flying by the seat of our pants. Mm -hmm. It's me. Um, And a lot of times what I've discovered, too, for those of us who do that, it's totally um, a trauma response. It's a, you know, because for those who have experienced trauma, we we have to think quick. We have to be quick on our feet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, slowing down and being intentional and thinking things through as opposed to just, oh, I'll just see how I feel when I get there, (laughs) winging it. Yeah. It's it's really cool because you're not just healing yourself today, but you're also healing your inner child at Oof. the same time. Yeah. You know? so. Two for one. Yeah, it's a two for one. It's a win, win. Yeah. One of my yeah. uh, rituals uh, that I've recently, I've, I've always done it, but I'm realizing it's, it's yeah. just that, is walking. Yes. I love to walk. It's the best. I'm not running. No, I'm not jogging. Uh-uh, I, ain't I am jog. walking. walking. And it was actually on my walk today mm-hmm. that I realized that mm-hmm. it's kind of in my blood. Like yeah. my great aunt, yeah. who's 92, she to this day walks every day. Yes. My grandmother, who passed away just shy of 92, she was a mm. walker. She walked all the time. Yes. And I love it. And I had this thought recently, too, where I was like, my Mm -hmm. future self Mm -hmm. is going to be so grateful that current Ashley is moving her body in this way. Yes. Like, it just, I had this feeling of, like, your future self needs this today. Mm -hmm. She needs you to be Mm -hmm. moving your body the way that you're moving it with looking at nature and hearing the sounds and being intentional about taking deep breaths. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm I'm really, it started out as like a fitness thing, but then yeah. I was like, I just like to walk. Like, I just like to walk. <laughs> yeah. That's my meditation. Exactly. That's yeah. the thing. I mean, it's, it's like if it enriches you and it makes mm-hmm. you feel whole and it makes you feel um, grounded, that's really like. That's the sweet spot. That is a sweet spot. 
Uh, Brandy, what has been your takeaway from our conversation today? Mm, my takeaway that our stories matter. Yeah. Our stories matter. Uh, everyone has a different ritual. I like yours. Mm, Walking. Mm -hmm. I need to do that more. Um, yeah. We all have our stories and they all should be honored. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. My my takeaway is honestly just how wonderful it feels to be in the presence of someone who has dedicated their life truly to taking care of other people. Mm -hmm. It's 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 heartwarming, it's genuine, it's it's feel good, it's inspiring. Mm -hmm. Um and you know, people as wonderful as you deserve to be acknowledged. Thank you. You know, honored, seen fully. And um, I'm just grateful that I that I get the privilege of being able to do so with you today. Thank truly. you. And likewise. Thank you. My heart feels so, so full much. today. <laughs> yeah, and I'm really proud of you. Thank you. And I'm so excited to see, like, what 2024 looks like for you. Thank you. I'm excited. It's going to be great. It's going to be an I amazing feel it. year, Brandy. I feel it too. I feel it. I really do. Um, it's going to be good. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> thank you for this having me. This is amazing. Me. You're the best. You're the best. I appreciate <laughs> you for having me here. Oh, thanks. So good. Anytime. Anytime. So good. I appreciate yeah. it. We did it. We did it. <laughs> Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lantigua. Our managing producer is Fatima El Swiffy. Shanice Tyndall is our lead producer. Associate producer is Mona Hassan. Jordan Thompson is our marketing coordinator. This episode was mixed by Trin Lightburn. Michelle Baker is our video editor. This episode was recorded at Spotify Studios, LA. Promotional consideration, products and services furnished by Spotify. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you did, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcast to ensure you hear the next one. <laughs>